What's up, everybody? Welcome to the 4040 Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Colette Abdallah, and I'm joined today by an incredibly special guest, former Atlanta Falcon star offensive lineman and current Ring of Honor member, Todd McClure. How's everything going today, Todd? Man, going great. I appreciate y'all having us on and uh, look forward to it. It's always a uh, need to do something different and with somebody in a, a different part of the country. So you guys are in Cali. We're in Louisiana. I'm ready, sure. man. For sure, for sure. So today's topic is you, your career, <laughs> your journey to, you know, from LSU to the Falcons to the Ring of Honor. So we're just going to talk about you and everything that you've been through in your career. So first of all, Absolutely. congratulations oh, on being inducted you. into the Ring of Honor. It's a huge honor, no pun intended. How did that feel? What was that day like for you? Man, it was unbelievable. Uh, you know, to, to go back that day uh, made me think about the whole process, you know, from when we were young and uh, the way my parents raised us. And to get to that point, going in the ring of honor of a professional sports franchise, it's, uh, you know, you got, you got to pinch yourself. It's pretty special. And there were a lot of people uh, that were part of my journey along the way. You know, this wasn't a, an accomplishment that was just me, all me. You know, there was a team of people from family and friends and teammates that that got me to that point. And uh, it was just a special day. And you've had quite the journey. So you grew up in Louisiana. You go to LSU. What was behind the decision to go to LSU? And were there some other schools that you considered possibly? You know, I grew up a uh, LSU fan, Tigers fan. We'd go, you know, just about every Saturday and watch the Tigers play. Uh, so I always said that, you know, if if LSU offered, that's where I was going to go. The other team that I loved was Notre Dame. You know, at the time when I was growing up in, in the 80s, Notre Dame was on TV all the time. You know, Tim mm -hmm. Brown and, and those guys. And uh, so Notre Dame never offered, LSU did. You know, so they made that decision easy for me. I wasn't highly recruited coming out of high school. Uh, LSU was probably the biggest school, or not probably, they were the biggest school that offered all the in-state schools offered Southern Miss, uh, Hawaii, you know, but I wasn't going to Hawaii. I would have loved to, but, uh, would have been nice. Yeah. You know, so it was easy. My decision was easy. LSU offered, uh, I committed there and, you know, it was four years that were just an unbelievable time in my life, uh, playing in Tiger stadium and, uh, for LSU it was great. And you played with, with some legends there, Alan Fanica, Booger McFarland, Kevin <laughs> Falk. I don't yeah. want to put you on the spot, but who did you learn the most from you know, they, at that during your time at LSU? Yeah, absolutely. So those guys, Booger, Booger McFarlane and Kevin, we all came in together. We were the same, uh, us three, we were in the same class. Alan was a year ahead of us. Uh, we had, I had a couple guys that were older that, that kind of took me under their wing. A guy named Mark King, he was an offensive guard. I was a senior at that time. Uh, and a guy named Ben Bordelon, uh that he has a successful uh, shipbuilding business now down in South Louisiana. But those two guys were uh, huge mentors. Another guy, Sean Wells, uh, they took a young guy under their wing, taught me the ropes. You know, I got in, I started lifting with the older guys as a freshman, and I didn't want to be embarrassed, you know. So if they put uh, 400 pounds on a bar, even if I couldn't do it, I was going to try, you know. So. Those guys pushed me. They taught me the ropes and uh, along the way. And then, like you mentioned, Alan Fanica, I got to play uh, beside a guy that, that is in the Hall of Fame now. So everybody, he was a high draft pick to the Pittsburgh Steelers first round. Um, and everybody was coming to watch him. So whenever they were coming to watch Alan on tape, I was a center player next to him. So I owe him a lot for, you know, scouts coming to look and say, well, who's this center, sure. you know, that's, that's mm -hmm. playing next to Fanica because he made us all look good. Yeah, I mean, he's an all-timer, Hall of Famer, like you said, Super Bowl champ, I believe, with, with the Steelers, maybe two-time Super Bowl champ. Yeah, yeah. So he's, he's a big deal. Um, if I read correctly, you played tight end in high school and then you transitioned to offensive line. Did you transition to offensive line at LSU or in high school? Well, i tell you, uh, you know, it. I played tight end and defensive end in high school. Uh, we were an athletic family, grew up playing basketball. Uh, baseball was my first love. My daddy played college basketball. He was a college basketball coach. Uh, so we played them all. And when in high school, uh, the spot I could help my team out most was at tight end and defensive end. Uh, 
uh, Steve Ensminger, who has coached all over college football. He's coached his last stint was at LSU with Joe, Joe Burrow. I'm sure you heard of that guy. Uh, but, but Steve and my dad were, were high school teammates. My dad was a little bit ahead of Steve. They were family friends. And Steve had told us at one point when I was young, he's like, if he wants an opportunity to play college uh, football, he needs to move to center because, you know, in high huh. school, I was adequate at tight end, but I didn't have college speed. Uh, I didn't have the motor to play defensive end, and Steve saw enough that, you know, he knew my best path would be at center. So in high school, my junior year, I would start the game at center. I'd wear number 55. I'd get two series to try to get tape. And then after those two series, I would change jerseys, go to number 89, and then I'd play tight end and defensive end. That's amazing. I mean, high school football is just the the purest form of the sport where – you got guys doing stuff like that, changing jersey numbers, playing both ways. <laughs> that's all. That's a great. That's a great story. Uh, so tell me about the draft process. I mean, I, you were great at LSU. I believe you were all conference a couple times. You guys had a good run during your time there. You end up being drafted by the Atlanta Falcons. Tell me about the draft process and and what that was like. The preparation that went into that and where you thought you were going to get drafted versus where you ended up. Perhaps. Oh, absolutely. So going into the draft. Uh, you know, I was being told anywhere from third to fifth round. Uh, I'm undersized. You know, I'm six one. Uh, at the time coming out of the draft, I was probably two ninety five. Um, so I think that was the biggest thing that that teams were scared of. You know, an undersized guy. Can he play this position? Uh, so we go in and you know lift weights. Me and Booger train together. A uh, good buddy of ours, Kurt Hester, who's actually the strength uh, coach at Tulane now. Kurt's been all over the country. One of the best strength and conditioning guys that, that has ever, I've ever been around. He is the best I've ever been around. Uh, at the time, he was at LSU, and then they let him go, and he was, had a, a personal training facility. So he had a bunch of guys that trained. Fanica was there. You know, he came out the year before. But, uh, you know, he got us ready for the combine. So we went to the combine. My numbers weren't. They weren't great. I mean, they were good. My bench press was, uh, I would say, above average. Um, so it comes to draft day, and I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I could possibly go in day one. Um, and you hear mm -hmm. stories about people all the time. They have these high expectations, and it's a big letdown when you're thinking, all right, I'm going on this first day. They're going to call my name. You've told all these friends and families, come on, come over. We're going to have food. You know, get ready to hear my name called, and then it doesn't happen. You know, so it's kind of a shock. And then uh, we get some calls after day one. One of the teams that had called my agent was Detroit, uh, San Francisco, out there in the Bay Area. There was another yep. team that had reached out. They would say, you know, if we if you're still available at our pick, uh, we'll probably take you in the fourth round. Uh, so the fourth round comes and goes. It doesn't materialize. And luckily in the seventh round, I get a call from uh, an Atlanta area code. And it's Coach Dan Reeves telling me that I was being drafted to the Atlanta Falcons. And that was just an unbelievable weight off my shoulders and was the start of my journey in the NFL. And your journey got off to a bit of a rocky start, right? So you, you missed your rookie year with injury, but clearly they thought highly enough of you to keep you around for, you know, the, the for your second year and beyond. So what was that rookie year like and rehabbing from your injury and all that? And how did you stay focused on, uh, on, you know, your rehab and everything else? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the draft happens in, uh, March, I believe, or whenever the draft is. And right after, you know, you go to your report. So we, I reported to Atlanta, uh, we started strength and conditioning and then we had some mini camps and OTAs, uh, you don't have pads on, but you, you know, helmets and you're out there kind of showing your skills a little bit. Uh, so I guess I was able to impress the coaches enough during those OTAs and mini camps that when I tore my ACL the second day of training camp, um, you know, they put me on IR. They can either injury settle with you, give you a settlement, or they can put you on IR and bring you back the next year. Luckily, uh, that's what they did. Uh, the you know I thought when I tore my ACL I was like man my career is over you know mm -hmm. I had hadn't even started have I shown enough uh, and fortunately I did you know and then so we go through the rehab 
get everything healed up and ready to go. And then halfway through my second year, I become the starting center at Atlanta and the rest is history. Yeah, absolutely. It's an incredible story. I mean, yeah, and obviously you showed them enough that they, they had the faith in you to keep you around despite the, you know, the seventh round pick and the injury and all that. So you mentioned taking over in your second year. I believe at that time your quarterback was already, you know, this guy named Michael Vick that some of us might be familiar with. So at, when did you know he was special? At what so, point was it day yeah, one? I'll tell you when, it, you know, when, when I first started getting in some uh, playing time, I want to say it was San Francisco. Chris Chandler was our starting quarterback uh, at okay. the time. And Chris, Mike's first time to come in a game, you know, in a big time role, Chris got knocked out. He got a concussion. So we're backed up in the end zone in the old, uh, in San Francisco's old state candlestick. Uh, man, just still had the dirt cut out, you know, the baseball game, just <laughs> yeah, old school. Right. You know, you see NFL films and the old dirt cutouts where they play in baseball and football. So we're backed up in the end zone and they cart or they take Chris off. Mike comes in the huddle. We're sitting in the huddle during a TV timeout and this dude takes his helmet off and he reaches in his helmet and grabs a stick of chapstick. <laughs> puts it on his lips and me and Keenan Forney's right next to me. We look at each other and we's like, dude, he's just put on chapstick. This is his first time in the game. Like he was just calm, you know, here we go. We about ready to play. Uh, and that game you saw glimpses of what made Michael Vick great. And you played with him for, for several years. It's probably hard for you to pick one moment that stood out. I mean, for me, it was when you guys went into green Bay and <laughs> That's the <it>. Packers, yeah. <laughs> but I don't yeah, want to steal my, your thunder on that, but tell me about that game. That was incredible. One of my you know, childhood memories for sure. Absolutely. So we go into that game and uh, nobody gave us a chance. Green Bay had never been beaten the playoffs. And uh, so Brett Farr is still there and just so much history and tradition and, you know, Lambeau Field. Uh, like I said, nobody gave us a shot. We go in and Mike Vick was electric. You know, we had Warwick Dunn, uh, TJ Duckett, Algie Crumpler. Those guys were just unbelievable out on the football field and our running game uh with Warwick Dunn and TJ Duckett and Mike Vick on the bootlegs was just unstoppable and you know there was points in that game you see the video all the time Mike scrambles to the left uh Kabir Baha Bia Miller he's got him it looks like it's gonna be a 15 yard sack a loss Mike throws him to the side scrambles around I think he hits Algie Crumpler but those were some of the theatrics that he did that night that, that allowed us to go beat Green Bay 27-7 to in, the, in their home field, first time it ever been done in, in the history of the, the franchise. And in speaking from a, maybe a more like technical perspective for the position and playing offensive line, what was it like you know, blocking for a guy like that that was going to hold on to the ball a little bit longer and make guys miss and take off running? What was that like versus you know dealing with a – maybe a more traditional quarterback back there. Yeah, absolutely. It was with Mike, it was kind of a uh, blessing and a curse. You know, you never knew, sure. <laughs> you never knew where he was going to be in the pocket. Uh, but also if we, if we, you know, you're going to get beat at times. And if you get beat, Mike had the ability to make guys miss to, to Houdini spin and, and take off. And uh, I mean, everybody saw uh, the, the walk off run that he had 60, 70 yard run in Minnesota to win that game for us. He was just a special type of athlete um, that just got caught up in the wrong situations. But, you know, great guy, great teammate. And I was happy that he was a teammate of mine for several years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and tell us about Mike Vick as a person. I mean, I think we all know about him as a player, incredible athlete, one of the most fun quarterbacks to watch of all time. But, you know, in the locker room as a personality, what was he like with the rest of the guys, especially – when he became that superstar talent. Yeah, Mike was great. You know, he was a great guy to hang out with. Uh, I think if you ask Mike now, he wishes he would have spent more time in the playbook. Um, you know, he he didn't put the time in that he should have, and I think he would tell you that. Uh, but as far as hanging out, unbelievable dude. At one time, you know, I had hair down to my shoulders, and uh, Mike always had uh, a guy come do his hair, and they kind of dared me one day to, to wear dreadlocks for a game. So I went to, to Mike's house and uh, he hooked me up with his stylist, man. And I had the uh, cornrows. I had the best set of cornrows, went into the game. Uh, 
But that's the type of guy he was. You know, he took care of his linemen. Uh, great guy. Just just got caught up in, in the wrong thing. And I'm sure if he could go back, everybody makes mistakes in life. He would he would do things differently. Sure, sure. I think that that's always a sign of a good quarterback is someone that takes care of their linemen. I'm sure he got you guys some, you know, amazing gifts when he uh, rushed for a thousand yards and took care of you guys in different ways. So that's yeah, great to absolutely. hear. So, so after the the Mike Vick era ends, you have a couple, you know, a little bit of a quarterback shuffle, and then you guys draft Matt Ryan very early in the first round. What was your early impressions of Matt Ryan as a as a player and a person? Yeah, Matt, just unbelievable guy. I knew early on we drafted him. Uh, you know, I watched him at Boston College do some some really good things. And then uh, when we go to mini camps and OTAs, and the first time he steps in the huddle, you knew right away this guy knows what he's doing. You know, he just had a confidence about him uh, that everybody noticed. And he was a guy that studied the playbook. He was the first in the build and the last one to leave, uh, that type of guy. Uh, always knew where everybody was supposed to be on the field. Um, I tell people all the time, just a true, true professional. And I personally think that one day uh, he'll get that gold jacket and be in, a, in the Hall of Fame. Because you look at his numbers, I know his last year wasn't uh, what anybody expected uh, in Indianapolis, but the numbers he's put up over his career and the type of football player he was, I think he deserves to be there. Yeah, I think it's hard to argue against that. I mean, given the the numbers, the achievements, the MVP, the Super Bowl trip. Yeah, you know, and I, I think, you know, I think yeah. if people knock that uh, Matt's never won, never won a Super Bowl, but you look at his quarterback rating and what he did in that Super Bowl, it wasn't because of his ability, you know, and it's a team sport. But you look at the way he played in that game, they should have had a ring. And, you know, I hear it all the time. We're down here in Saints country. and. Oh. They talk about twenty eight to three, you know, and not having a ring and this and that. So, and we, myself and my wife Heidi, were were at that game, and uh, we had two Patriots fans sitting in front of us, and I'm gonna say we talked a little trash because they were obnoxious early. Uh, we got up twenty eight to three, and we're like, man, this is it. We're gonna win this thing, and uh, the rest is history. You know, it didn't happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I was right there with you. I, I mean, I'm a Raiders fan, so definitely anti-Patriots. I, was, <laughs> oh, I hear that. Go back I to was, the tuck you know, rule, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I was wearing my Michael Vick jersey that day. I was feeling good. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, things turn in a, in a very negative way. But, I mean, yeah, Matt Ryan, I mean, you don't play for as long as he did for as well as he did without being a, a special player. And what was that transition like going from, you know, having a guy that's the most athletic dude on the field running around to a more traditional, you know, upright style of quarterback in Matt Ryan? You know, it was definitely different. So, you know, uh, Bobby Petrino came in. He thought Mike Vick was going to be his quarterback. And then Mike gets in trouble. Uh, and then at the time, we we bring in Joey Harrington, Byron Lefwich, uh you know, those guys were the quarterbacks that year. And then between that and Matt Ryan, we had a, a guy that also played the high level, Matt Shaw. Yeah. Uh, Matt was a really good player. A, a lot of the same skills that Matt Ryan had. And then, you know, we traded him to the Texans and he went and had a really good career there in Houston. And now he's back in Atlanta uh, working with the quarterbacks. So we kind of had a slow transition from, a, you know, a quarterback that could run, that could get it uh, to Matt. And the good thing about uh, Matt Ryan, his rookie year, we had a really good running game. Uh, Michael Turner, who was at uh, with the Chargers, you know, we were able to sign him in free agency, uh, bring in a guy named Tony Gonzalez. It wasn't a bad tight end. And, uh, and then you have Julio and Roddy White. So he had a lot of pieces around him to help him ease into the NFL game and had a really good rookie year. Yeah, I mean, you've played with some incredible talents. You know, I was going on your football reference page looking at some <laughs> of the, the teams that you were on. I honestly forgot that you played with Tony Gonzalez, you know, one of the greatest tight ends of all time. But, you know, I, I saw Roddy White, Julio Jones early on, you know, Warwick Dunn, et cetera. What made these guys different? What I mean, besides from, you know, God-given natural talent, what made these guys so special? And how yeah. did they produce so well on Sundays? No, oh, absolutely. You look at a guy like, I'll start with Warwick Dunn, um, and you see his story and his history and the type of person that he is. 
he always felt like he had to prove himself. You know, like me, he was a smaller guy, um, but he's done it over and over again. You know, went to Tampa, got drafted by Tampa, had a great career, but he was behind Mike Allstott. So he, he was kind of playing second fiddle. And then Atlanta gave him the opportunity to be the dude. And he came to Atlanta, and you watch some of Warwick Dunn's highlights, and it's just unreal. The guy, you know, his, his shiftiness, he never took a hit. Nobody ever squared Warwick Dunn up. He knew how to – he was smaller, but he knew how to twist and turn his body to where he never took a lick, never took a hit on collision. Uh, but just a class act all the way around. And then a guy like Roddy White who comes in, struggles early. You know, the, the pro game was a, a bit of a, a, a punch in the face to him. He didn't know how to work. You know, he didn't know how to put in the time. Uh, but Roddy was one that he didn't always practice hard. But when the lights came on and it was Sunday or it was Monday night, Roddy White was going to show up. Uh, tremendous player also in the, in the Falcons ring of honor. Uh, yeah. And then you look at a specimen like Julio Jones. He comes in. Uh, when he was healthy, Julio was as good as anybody that's ever played the game. Uh, I've never seen a guy work like Julio work. He was a practice guy. He was a game day guy. He was just a true professional. You never, you never heard Julio's name mentioned negatively in the media uh, with anything off the field. He was just a true pro. Um, and then Tony Gonzalez, a guy like Tony Gonzalez, to see his pre-practice routine and what he's done for years and the amount of footballs that he catches before practice, after practice, there's a reason why, uh, you know, he's one of the best to ever play that position, and he was a great teammate. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, all-time great, Hall of Famer, all that stuff. Julio definitely on his way to getting that gold jacket at some point. He's definitely he's like the the anti diva receiver. Absolutely, he said. Yeah, <laughs> you never just heard a guy him that say, just went out there yeah. and yeah, you're right. He just, you know, most of those guys receivers defensive backs you know the dbs are probably the ones that talks the most trash and the most diva uh you never heard julio complain about not getting catches you know you look at uh, i mean right now Diggs, and you look at uh jamar chase who's an lsu guy but anytime they're not getting their touches they're they're going some kind of way talk about it in the media you know uh you never heard that out of julio it didn't matter i'm sure he was frustrated he never showed it, never talked about it. Just went out there and did what he was supposed to do when he was healthy. Yeah, he was never the guy that's going to say, you know, give me the damn ball or right. whatever it was <laughs> that Jamar Chase said said this week. That's right. uh, you know, so well, you, you played for a long time. I believe it was 13 years. You were an Ironman. You just, by my count, you played 144 straight games when yep. I was doing my research. I think I'm right there. So, and then in your final year, I believe you also played 15 or 16 games. So ultimately, what went into your decision to retire? What, what was it that, just, that was kind of the last draw for you? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I played 14 years. I know, you know, on the Internet, they got it wrong. Cause, and everybody, everybody thinks it was 13 because I okay. started in 1999. Uh, people forget to count 2000, you know, so you go. That's, there you, go. you know, uh, so it happens all the time. But 14 years, uh, I wanted to come back and play one more. We went to the NFC Championship game, uh, played San Francisco, who went on to the Super Bowl that year. We got within 15 yards of the goal line to go to the Super Bowl. We had a special team. Uh, I wanted to come back for one more year. Uh, we had drafted a young center that year, uh, my last year. They thought it was time for, for him to. Uh, take the reins and uh, really wanted to come back guys wanted me back uh, you know Matt Tony those guys went and kind of uh, talked to the higher ups but they decided they wanted to go with the younger guy didn't quite work out for them uh, but you know no regrets I look back had a great career and was blessed to be in uh, one city with one team my entire career yeah that's definitely rare I mean it, it was that part of your decision to perhaps not pursue another opportunity somewhere else with another team yeah absolutely because i got a few phone calls and uh one of my old o-line coaches paul boudreau who had gotten fired a year or two earlier was at in st louis at the time uh scott wells was their center scott got hurt he had called and um i want to say well yeah les sneed les sneed who's the gm now with the, the rams uh 
he was in St. Louis at the time with the franchise. Uh, they were going to bring me in for a workout. Uh, never happened. I really, I probably could have pursued other opportunities. Uh, but at that moment, it was going to be, you know, Atlanta or, or nobody. And my body's probably happy that I didn't go back and play one more. Yeah, I feel like I've heard a few times from from retired NFL players, like it's always better to retire a year early than a year late. And you're I'm sure your knees and your ankles and your hands and all that, they all thank you for, for taking that, uh, yeah, that next you, step. I mean, you look at, uh, you know, everybody's watching everything Kelsey right now, but uh, and I love it too. You look at him on that that episode on Amazon and his decision trying to decide do I want to go back and play one more you know he talked about how much his body hurt week in and week week out um and that's a true fact but you know for him being in the Super Bowl not winning a Super Bowl it was worth putting his body through it another year to get the opportunity to go get a ring and I respect the hell out of that and what did you do differently you know when you're 29 30 years old versus when you're 24, 25, to be able to play week in and week out. And as I mentioned, you played, I think, like I said, 144 games in a row. How did you change your preparation to be able to do that? You know, every everything kind of stayed the same for me. And guys used to, they used to be in awe a little bit because in the off offseason, um, I didn't go in a weight room. I didn't do anything other than we have property and we have a farm. Uh, I did manual labor, worked outside building fences, bailing hay. Um, so that was my way of getting in shape. And I think it also allowed my joints and my body time to heal. Uh, whereas other guys were going to work out right away. Um, mm. You know, is this something that worked for me? I don't know if it worked for everybody, uh, but it worked for me over my entire career. And I was also blessed and fortunate. You got to have a little bit of luck on your side. Uh, you got to be able to play through injuries everybody's going to be hurt you're never going to be 100 percent. there were probably several times in my career where i don't know if i necessarily needed to be out there on the field but found a way because i didn't want to let my teammates down to push through it you know and you know there's there's times on film i'm sure you could look at at games and be like how's this guy to start in center you know because i wasn't 100 percent. there were things going on uh but was able to go out there and, and push through it that's incredible. You had that that country strength, that uh, that's right. country yeah. strong mentality. You know, being able to fight through uh, injury or being hurt. I mean, there's that that famous saying: the coaches ask, like, "Are you hurt or you're injured?" Right. If you're injured, you can't play. If you're hurt, you know, buckle up. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> that's um, right. So I got quick. So a couple quick questions about uh, you know, do some quick hitters about your career. What was your favorite away stadium to play at in uh, in your career? Man, I love Seattle. Seattle was just different, uh, different environment. The weather was 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 cool. Uh, the crowd noise was unbelievable. But Seattle Stadium just had a a different feel to it, and I really like. Had a couple opportunities to go play there. Uh, really like Seattle. And you know, I know you're over in the Bay Area. We came to, uh, we played San Francisco. Well, that was when Michael Vick got in the game. San Francisco and Oakland in back to back weeks and got to spend a week out. We stayed at there in California. Really, they flew our wives out, really enjoyed our time there, went to the wharf, and, uh, you know, really neat experience for us. Very cool. What was your least favorite opponent? New you Orleans. You could say team. New Orleans, okay. New Orleans. <laughs> you know, they're a hated, hated rival. Uh, you know, uh, uh, at the Saints and Falcons, just it's like all in water, don't mix. And it's tough for me being in Louisiana, growing up in Louisiana, and going to play for the Falcons. But that, that's an easy answer. I don't like New Orleans. Okay. <laughs> Who's someone that, you know, when you saw him pop up on your scouting report, you were like, oh, I'm not looking forward to this? Because you, you played in the era with some, some real hitters out there. So who's somebody that you really did not enjoy playing against? Chris Jenkins. He was the uh, guy that I had to get prepared for the most. He, he was at Carolina. We played him twice a year, uh, 6'6", 330, quick as a cat, and he can embarrass you in a heartbeat. So uh, Chris Jenkins was, was a guy that, that I hated playing against. Okay. I would have guessed Warren Sapp, but Chris well, Jenkins. Well, you know, that's... Warren, he talked so much trash, but uh, Warren played the three technique. So uh, Chris played the shade or he played the nose. Yeah. 
I hit Warren from time to time. I mean, Warren from time to time. I wish I would have hit him a little bit more. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, he's an unbelievable player, man. He talked trash the whole time. Uh, Leroy Glover was a guy that played in New Orleans that was really special. Kyle Williams, uh, who was at Buffalo for a long time. I hated playing against guys like that. Um, I mean, and the list goes on and on. There's so many guys that inside that you had to be ready for. Yeah, absolutely. That, those are some incredible names, Hall of Fame type names. Um, yeah. So I don't blame you there. Uh, <laughs> let's see, favorite opponent, someone that you enjoyed playing against, maybe because of the, you know, pre-snap conversation, <laughs> whatever it might be. You know, I, Tampa probably. Uh, during my time there, my buddy Booger McFarland. You know, he was a nose guard. We lined up across from each other. Uh, we battled in college every day, so we always had some good talk. And then uh, when Booger left and went to Indy, they had a guy named Chris Hovan. Chris was with Minnesota, signed with Tampa, and he was a smart guy that played the game the right way. And we we both had a mutual respect for how each other prepared, and we knew he knew what our offense was going to do. I knew what their defense was going to do. Uh, he was always fun to play against and, and a tough guy to, to block also. For sure. Would you rather play in the rain or the snow? Uh, <laughs> the the snow for sure. I hated playing, being a center in rain games. You always had to worry about the ball being slick and getting a snap back there. Uh, I think I played twice in the snow, once in Philly, once in Green Bay. But Green Bay, it wasn't bad. You know, got a few snow flurries towards the end of the game. So I've never really played in a in a game where the field was covered with snow. So give me gotcha. the snow over the rain. Yeah, I, I played center in high school as well. So I'm familiar, <laughs> at least with, with the general mechanics of it. Oh, yeah. Uh, do you prefer under center or shotgun? You know, I'm old school, I guess. Uh, a little bit easier to me, guy being under center. When a shotgun snaps, you know, you got to be precise. And uh, you play in center, you know, when you go to block back on a counter, that was always the toughest block in shotgun because you're moving one way really quick and you had to make sure your snap was online. So uh, I'd rather a, a quarterback under center. It was just a little bit easier. For sure, for sure. Do you prefer college football or NFL football to watch? Oh man, that's I can't pick I can't pick that because I I just enjoy the game you know whether it's high school college uh, or a pro game. Of course, I like the college game. It just has a different feel to it. You know, it seems like stronger fan bases. You know, uh, so but I, I just love football in general. Yeah, I'm I'm with you. I mean, I I love college football for the pageantry, the rivalries. Right. You know, I've always wanted to go to like a a big time SEC game. Every time I'm watching, you know, CBS on a Saturday afternoon, I tell my wife, I'm like, this is on my bucket list, like Florida, <laughs> Georgia, or LSU, Ole Miss, like one of these big yeah, time, you need to do it, big man. time robberies. You definitely yeah, need one of to these do days it. for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, final question. Um, who's winning the Super Bowl this year? Oh man. Uh, I think we could, well, I don't know. I mean, right now the first three teams that pop in my mind are, I'll give you four. Kansas City, Buffalo, San Francisco, Philly. You know, that's my four that, that just pop off right away. Uh, if I had to put everything, if you made me pick one, it's hard to bet against Kansas City. You know, you just – Patrick Mahomes is fun to watch. I love when he comes on, if they can stay healthy. Uh, Pacheco, the, the running back, dude just runs at a different – type of angry you know he was kind of like <laughs> he runs I, I think even harder than Marshawn Lynch did he's just fierce the way he runs it's all gonna come down to who stays healthy uh and I think if, if Kansas City stays healthy with Chris Jones on that defensive line and and what they do Kansas City will probably win another one San Francisco a, looks strong yeah. though mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a safe bet to to just pick Patrick Mahomes and yeah. you know, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. At least you That's pick right. the best quarterback. Uh, so what what have you been up to in, in retired life? You've been retired for a little bit of a while now. So what have you been up to? You know, it's uh, a couple of things, coaching, you know, kids, uh, baseball, football, uh, helped out at the high school with football. Um, I've got a wood business, 6M Antique Woods. We, buy wood from all over the country and we make flooring and wall material beams uh tables 
different things like that. And then, uh, you know, I raise bucking bulls, rodeo bulls. I don't know if you're familiar wow. with like the PBR. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's all about genetics. It's kind of like the, the race horse business, the thoroughbred business. You breed, put, trying to get the right combinations together. That's one of my passions. I really love the animals and uh, trying to make that perfect match. And uh, now, you know, starting this podcast, uh, the snap back with T Mac, it was something that I've always wanted to do. I, I enjoyed talking football. I used to do the post game show for LSU. Uh, so I'd go on with one, one of the local guys here and we would talk about LSU. Uh, so this is something I just want to kind of get my, my stories out with old teammates. Um, so we're going to give it a whirl. The Snapback with T-Mac, we're on all podcast platforms on YouTube. Uh, should have our first episode, first full episode airing pretty quick, man. So I love it. Awesome. love talking football. Yeah, I believe I'm already subscribed to you on, on YouTube. <laughs> but whatever else you got out there, I'd be sure to, to subscribe and follow and share and all that and you know put a link in the podcast description and all that. So thank you so much. This was incredible. Um, I. I could talk to you for hours, to be honest. No, I'm with you, man. <laughs> hey, you, you were know. great, man. I enjoy, you know, you could tell you got a lot of knowledge and you love the game. So we'll definitely have to do this again. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we'll do a, a season recap or something like that. See if your, uh, your final four pick and your KC pick were, were on point. So, Well, hold on. Let me put you on a, on a oh, sure. little pressure on you right now. So who's Please. your college team? We talked about your pro team being the Raiders. Who's your college team? You know, it's tough, man, because I, I grew up in the Bay Area, right? It's not it's not a college football hotbed. I right. generally just kind of root for the Pac-12. Gotcha. Gun to my head, if I had to pick, it would be Cal. Just okay. Because, I, you know, I lived in the area. But in general, I, I still, like I said, I love college football. I love the game. So I just kind of root for the Pac-12 in, in general. I got you. Now, who, who, you, who do you think is going to win the Super Bowl? It's got to be KC. There I, we go. Right. You know, <laughs> I think last year their defense was okay. Right. This year it looks elite. It's yeah. uh, They shut down Jacksonville. They shut down Detroit. And you pair that with Mahomes. I know he doesn't have as many weapons as he did in the past, but you just can't bet against that guy. I agree with you. And you look this past week, they played the Jets, who the Jets' defense is just unbelievable. You know, you hate to see that. With, you're talking about Cal with Aaron Rodgers. Uh, that Jets team, would, I think, would have made a run. You see how special their defense is and what they did to to Martin and those guys. So uh, I'm with you. KC should should win this thing. Yeah, it hurts me to say that as a Raiders fan, but <laughs> I <know>. hear that. <laughs> <laughs> it's reality. Yeah. All right, my friend, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. All right, let's do it again, man. Thank For you. Sure. Nice meeting you. You too.